Okay, it's four o'clock. <laughs> um, I don't know if we should wait a few more minutes. I see there are people coming in. Okay, it's four o'clock, so we're going to start. Um, welcome to today's MCPD accredited webinar on pediatric brain cancers. Thank you for joining us. Um, this will be our last webinar for 2022, and we would like to thank everybody who supported us through this year. My name is Audrey Ludit. I'm the Program Development Manager for Child Childhood Cancer Foundation in South Africa. The fight against cancer is a team effort, and it takes a community of clinicians, staff, volunteers, parents, and families to ensure that no child is left behind or suffers due to a lack of care. Child Childhood Cancer Foundation in South Africa provides essential services and would not be able to do this without the collective commitment of all. CHOP offers comprehensive child and family support to children with cancer um, or life threatening blood disorders and their families. And we are privileged to, jo to journey with our beneficiaries um, in a very special way throughout this challenging time in their lives and beyond. In September 2018, the WHO launched the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. Um, with a goal of reaching 60% survival rate by 2030 while reducing suffering. And I think um, while reducing suffering is the most important word um, here because it is terrible to see that the child is diagnosed late and, and suffer. It, if successfully implemented, um, approximately 1 million additional children with cancer can be saved in the next decade. And then as part of CHOC's awareness program, um, we are hosting these CPD accredited uh, talks on the different childhood cancers and the early warning signs thereof. And we believe that early detection saves the lives. And in doing so, we hope to reduce the more, uh, mortality and morbidity of children with cancer. The webinars are available afterwards on YouTube. Please share that with your colleagues. Um, who would not be able to attend here today. Um, you are welcome to put your questions in the chat. So after Prof's talk, we will um, look at the chat and, and if there's time, um, you will answer the questions. We also want to thank the members of the SACCSG as usual, who voluntarily give of their time in support of these webinars. Now today I am very honored to welcome a very dear friend of Chuck and a highly respected pediatric oncologist in South Africa and globally. Prof. Alan Davidson is the head of pediatric pneumatology oncology services at Red Cross War Memorial Hospital and the University um, of Cape Town in South Africa. His clinical um, and research interests include pediatric brain tumors, HIV related cancers, genetic predisposition syndromes, stem cell transplants for primary immunodeficiency and adapted uh, therapy regimens for low and middle income settings. He coaches the South African Pediat Pediatric Brain Tumor Workshop and serves as the Vice President of the um, Society of Neuro-Oncology Sub-Sahara Africa branch. Having served as the co-chair of the International Society of Pediatric Oncology Global Health Networks, the previous PODC, he now chairs the Advocacy Committee. Please welcome um, Prof. Um, Davidson. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise um, about brain, brain cancers with us today. We are so thankful to have you with us. So um, we'll just give him access to manage his own um, PowerPoint. Over to you, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Before I put the PowerPoint on, well, um, uh, afternoon, everyone. Geez, that's a lot of words, Audrey. I've got to so shorten that, that whole jumble show. I've got to put many fewer words out there. Um, but thanks anyway. 
Um, I want to I want to make a special mention of Doreen Hutting, who's driving back to Worcester now and is zooming in her car into this meeting. So thanks to her. Um, Audrey, the Q&A, a couple of people are pointing out, um, including Fiona McKinnon from Peedspell, that the chat's disabled. Can you sort that out? Because what I'd like to suggest is the following. Guys, this is interactive. So number one, I'd like you in the chat to say who you are and what you are, a GP or a pediatrician. Those are my like favorite folks this afternoon, but we just like to see, you know, it'd be interesting for me to see who I'm talking to. Secondly, I'm going to ask some questions sort of clinical questions and then I, it's a little bit like those of you old enough to have seen the wonder years will uh, will remember that science teacher but I, we don't have time for the answers so we're just going to push through but it'd be nice to just give you a chance to respond in the chat um sorry yeah in the chat because I'd like you to use the q and a if you if you're asking a question so that's the other thing I'm very happy to interrupt the talk at any point it's not supposed to just be a dry lecture so if you have a query or if you don't agree with something, just bang it in the Q&A and, and, and we can work that way. But if we have the chat and the Q&A in the same place, it's going to be a mess. Um, good. So that's the whole nine yards. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and do a little bit of chatting. Um, so my brief for you is pediatric brain tumors. Confirm you're seeing my screen, Audrey. I think so. Yes, good. All right. We can see. Thank you. And the chat has been um, reset. So please, the attendees can try um, to, to chat on the well, chat. Again. Let's, let's have some fun for the next hour. <laughs> uh, I've got a. There we go. OK, so first off, just to say, as you heard from that whole litany of of sort of semi interests, oncologists outside of high income countries have to do everything. I mean, I have an interest in neuro, but I'm not a neuro oncology specialist. Um, we're going to start wide and sort of telescope in um, on this particular subject. I always get flack about rare. Now, rare conditions, if you add them all up, are common, but individually they're quite rare. And, and that particular issue around childhood cancer has implications not just for burden of disease and for our bargaining power politically. It also has implications for diagnosis. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. About 130 to 150 children under 15 per million, that's not million population, that's in that age band each year, develop cancer um, in, the, in, the, in the high income countries where they're very good registry. So that's pretty bulletproof, that data. We're recording about 100 in the Western Cape, similar sort of number in Gauteng. Is that a different epidemiology? Is that underreporting? It's probably a bit of both. Uh, we, we're not 100% sure. But going back to the rare issue, an average, the average pediatrician regards him or herself as unlucky if they see more than two childhood cancers a year. So we're asking them to pick out of 20 or 25 kids they see every day in office practice, more if you're in a clinical setting and you're a practice nurse or a, a primary uh, 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 health community worker seeing lots and lots of kids and and with gps it's less so that's important we have to be sympathetic about that and we have to keep on talking about the message so where are the brains in all of this so if that's an actual figure 150 per million uh, this is us data then you see the brains about 32 of those 150 odd about 22 percent and the the numbers from red cross it's always useful and interesting to see local data that that's as these are yearly 2016 through 2020 and we saw about that kind of number the average of 23 cases per year um now just before we talk about more about brains keep in mind what's the context in low and middle income countries and i want to say that we sit in an upper middle income country but it's one with enormous uh inequality we know that higher gini coefficient so there are there are low income countries inside our country, and I want to point something else, point out something else that, in the context particularly of neuro oncology, which is very much team sport, as uh, Audrey uh, referred to just now, um, there are there are things about the way our systems work that are not much better than some low income countries, and we have to think about that and not take anything for granted. But this is heartening. This is not meant to be disheartening. This particular message, uh, UNAIDS, Gates. Um, the big uh, uh, multinational uh, 
uh, NGOs and endowments threw a ton of money at HIV, at uh, uh, women and child health, at uh, tuberculosis, and actually improved the global under five mortality by cut the rate by 50% in the first decade of the century. And what that does mean for people who do what I do is that it means that there's more space now for us to look at non-communicable diseases and where they fit in and to focus on those illnesses as well as the, the sort of the, 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 the famous um, prematurity, uh, perinatal uh, uh, mortality and then infectious diseases. So the, again, the global picture, the, the established figure is about 250,000 children under 15 per year across the globe. Modeling suggests that the incidence, the, in other words, the total number, regard, regardless of whether they're diagnosed or not, is probably the other side of 400,000. That latter figure, I'm not completely sold on, but we can debate it. Ne neither side can prove the argument. What's important, though, is that you see in low and middle income countries, we have a lower incidence because we, we're not measuring everything um, for sure. And maybe it's slightly different incidence wise, but we have a substantially. And Audrey, can you see my, my, my mouse, my, um, my little arrow? Can you see it there? Okay. Yes, I, yes Alan, I can see it. Arbitrary, but you're going to have to just live with that for the moment. So the mortality is considerably higher. And so most of the deaths from childhood cancer occur in low and middle income countries. So what about uh, neuro-oncology? Well, uh, as I said earlier, about 20%, uh, it should be about 20% of the burden of disease. But if you look at the sort of figures reported in the literature, this is in the first 10 years of this century, you'll see that Ghana, Namibia, Nigeria um, reported considerably lower numbers in that. The South African Children's Re Registry was about 13%, so that's still too low. But if you look at referral centers, then it was probably more like the numbers we should be seeing. At least I can say that across the globe, things are improving. Serial registry data from Bangladesh shows a steady increase in the number of brain tumors that are being counted. And a lot of that's about the fact that kids are getting surgeries and then not being referred to oncologists, whether radiation or pediatric oncologists for further management. What types of tumor? So we're going to talk about these a little bit later. Um, the docs in the audience will be at least vaguely familiar with some of these entities. Um, and across the top, I've had to abbreviate because otherwise it makes the writing tiny small. Astrocytomas and all um, astrocytic tumors, medulloblastomas and other embryonal tumors, craniopharyngiomas, ependymomas, and germ cell tumors. And you can see that the first two on the left-hand side here make up the majority. The U.S. data may not be globally scalable, but it is 16,000 patients. So it's certainly a very robust data set. And you can see, for example, a gap here where craniopharyngiomas, because they're not sent to pediatric oncologists because they're not chemotherapy sensitive, were not picked up on our children's re registry to the extent that the other, the other more common tumors are. But the, but the numbers across the globe are pretty, pretty similar. There are little... Um, Little interesting uh, sort of outliers, germ cell tumors, for example, are, are, are very common in, in, in far Asia for reasons we don't completely understand in Japan and China and so on. You, and you see that here. So, so Lorna Renner, who's a giant in, in uh, African pediatric oncology, the, the head of the uh, Kolebu teaching hospital unit in Accra, spoke in a meeting in July uh, in Accra about some of the challenges that we face across Africa. And you can see here, this is a very health systems driven algorithm with all of the difficulties, right from poor access to primary care up to uh, diagnostics and health financing. I think, to, you know, that we're all colored by that palette to some degree or another. Now, she spoke about very much a personal reflection about the kind of difficulties with neurosurgery, with radiology, with radiation oncology, both with infrastructure and access. And I won't dwell on these. And pointed out that the GRCC, which Audrey referred to earlier, the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, has a cure-all strategy, which, you know, everyone loves an acronym, right? Medicine is full of them, um, where you can see some of the, the more important aspects um, of the, the multi-pronged strategy are brought out. Um, one of them being universal health coverage. So I think any good oncologist should be a, an ardent voice for universal health coverage. Um, and And... And to get back, so so just to point out that there is one brain tumor, which is low-grade glioma, 
amongst the six indexed cancers that have been chosen under the GRCC for particular attention. These are all been chosen for a variety of reasons, political, epidemiological, and so on, that I, I won't go into now. But what did she come up with in terms of recommendations? Now, things that we should own. Awareness of brain tumors being, she, she used a lovely phrase, intensified, but I like that. Uh, more training. And then lastly, again, to emphasize the MDT. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of that. And it's a concern to me that, that not many of the, of the centers across um, the country are functioning from a neuro point of view in, a, in an MDT way. Not to say there aren't challenges. So let's talk now about the subject at hand. Um, why brain tumors? Well, you've seen they're a, they're a fifth. They're the second only to leukemia in childhood cancer in terms of numbers, which means as a pediatrician, even as a GP, you're likely to see one somewhere, either on the diagnostic side or in shared care setting, or perhaps after they've been diagnosed and treated doing long-term follow-up, which is a very important part of sort of the community's responsibility. So you need some knowledge of the common tumors and a high index of suspicion for typical symptoms. And I'm going to talk about that in, in a little bit more depth. Also, most children do survive, um, but with considerable long-term morbidity. It's probably one of the, the least satisfactory and satisfying aspects of our pediatric oncology survivorship is the, the, the challenges that brain tumor survivors face. And, and again, so it's self-evident there, the importance. So 50 to 60% of these occur in the posterior fossa below the tentorium, right over here. And tumors of similar histology can arise in different parts of the CNA. So we tend to see, we look at these things not by geography, but by histology. In other words, what's the, what's the biological nature of the tumor? And one should not forget, remember, benign brain tumors are not benign. They will kill you too, um, because there's no space. So classification, there's a variety of embryonal tumors. I'll get back to this a bit later. And I mean, this is not meant to be, a, uh, as I say, a lecture per se. The glial tumors, um, which include a, a, a spectrum from quite um, sessile to very high grade, and also include ependymal tumors because ependymal cells are also glial cells. And then the, these rarities, craniopharyngioma, germ cell tumor, and the pituitary adenoma. What causes them? Well, the only thing that we can say for sure that from an exogenous point of view is radiation. So radiation of a sarcoma or a, 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 um, a, pre a previous brain tumor can give you commonly a meningioma is the, the commonest one. And those, those are really adult tumors in the main, although we do see them really. And then it's the brain tumors are associated with a variety of congenital um, syndromes. In terms of location, um, so I know these slides become available after these seminars. So I've put quite detailed stuff, which is useful from a reference point of view, but I have no intention of dragging you through the fine print today. But suffice to say, you'll appreciate that depending on where you are in the CNS, you're going to present differently. So the posterior fossa tumors, whether they're medulloblastomas or JPAs, pilocytic astrocytomas, will tend to give you cerebellar signs. And then those patients become, so they start off being a bit wonky and complaining of a headache, and then suddenly they're drowsy, and then they're asleep because now they've got raised pressure from hydrocephalus. Of course, all the long tracts go through the posterior fossa, including the brainstem. So you can get cranial nerve palsies and a hemiplegia, but that tends to be, that's fairly unusual, unusual. Whereas supratentorial tumors will give you a whole lot of visual disturbances. They may give you a, 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 a hemiplegia. They may give you um, uh, some of the more interesting uh, kind of um, uh, neurological phenomena. And then, of course, they will also still give you a headache and so on and so forth. Okay, so I just want to talk about awareness. I mean, I think if, 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 you, take, if you take this stuff the stuff I'm about to talk about in the next five to, to seven minutes away from this talk, I'll be happy. The other stuff you can look it up in, look up in books. Uh, we run a brain tumor meeting, um, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to sneak an advert in here, Audrey, because I will have an advertorial slide at the end. But we run a brain tumor meeting, a national meeting uh, in Cape Town uh, once a year at the end of the the academic calendar. And last year, I profiled HeadSmart, which is a United Kingdom campaign to raise awareness of brain tumors. And the question I was asking the audience is really, can we do something like that here? But 
let's let's walk you through the process. So a long time ago, when I was a baby doc in Birmingham, and I worked in the oncology there for a while. I met Sarah Wilm, who is a heavy hitter nowadays, and she, as her as her sort of trainee fellowship thesis, did um, the presenting features of brain tumors. It was a wonderful. It was a, it was a small data set, about two hundred kids, but very robust. And so she looked at symptoms and signs. So what do kids present with, and uh, what what do we find when we examine them, and I mean, it won't be of any surprise to the docs in the audience, headache, vomiting, ataxia, these are clearly the commonest, both on their own and also, as you can see in the white column, at some time during the course of the disease. But what's important is when you get below visual difficulties, look, you see education and behavior. So the kid that's not doing well at school, the kid that's suddenly behaving a bit oddly, um, growth and endocrine problems, and I'm going to show you some tragedies in a minute to make this point. These are also common, and they should, you need to account for a child who's suddenly not doing well at school. I mean, you should, that's a good pediatric axiom, regardless of what the diagnosis is, but it could be a brain tumor. Um, so, so that was kind of useful. So let me, let me give you these two. Um, um, I see lots of people putting in the chat. Thanks, guys, for sharing uh, your, your, your heritage or whatever on the chat. I know, just checking nothing more in the Q&A. Good, okay. Um, so this is one for the chat, guys. As said to, she came with a recurrent vomiting and she was investigated by the GI guys without success. She wasn't doing well at school and, and, and that was a stressor. And eventually she was referred to psychiatry for psychogenic vomiting. I'm not making any of this up, by the way. So nobody noticed that she was profoundly short. The first time I laid her eyes on her, honestly, she'd disappear under a school desk. And she'd, she, by that time, she'd been diagnosed with pan hyperpituitarism. She'd never had a scan. And the MRI showed a large craniopharyngioma. Gosh, and I'm supposed to ask you for the diagnosis. So you see, I blew that one. Let me give you the second one. Samantha was admitted to a regional hospital for severe failure to thrive at the age of 11 months. No cause found. The there was nystagmus noted by the OT. It was tucked away in her clinical notes. Nothing else. But she steadily underwent neurodegeneration. Um, and then she went off her feet and then presented with macrocephaly and a depressed level of consciousness, requiring CSF diversion. So any ideas about this potential diagnosis in this child? So like I say, it's not like the wonder years, right? We'll, um, we'll, we'll, uh, well done. No, uh, Fiona, but it's, it's not a bad thing. It, it, the, this, the, the presentation's too long for DIPG. Um, and Linda got cranio. Bless you. Sorry that I blew that one. So, so, um, so this was a, a low-grade glioma in in a um, supracellular region, which gives you a thing called. Um, uh, I've gone completely unknown. Can you believe it? That's your guest who can't remember something. So there's a good start. Um, dying cephalic syndrome. There it is, where the kids eat, but they just lose weight inexorably. Um, and and so sadly, she was very, very damaged by the time she came to our attention. So uh, there we go. So what is already known? Headaches are common. And brain tumors have a long symptom interval. That was known. What this showed was that besides visual symptoms, educational and behavioral problems are common. And that at diagnosis, the majority will have abnormal neurology. So it's very important. If you've got a headache in a child who's got nothing else that worries you and you don't find anything, you're probably fine not scanning them. If you see signs, you should scan the child. That's that's open and shut. And then lastly, a prolonged symptom interval is associated with low-grade tumors uh, with a variety of other phenomena. So so keep that in mind. So so HeadSmart was this campaign um, to, to try and improve the diagnosis of brain tumors with what's called the total diagnostic interval the time from the time the child complains to mom or is noticed by dad to have something wrong to the time they actually have a scan and a diagnosis made that's your total interval and and HeadSmart became uh it partnered with a brain tumor charity which gave it some teeth and it ran this extensive campaign you can see with these beautiful little i mean they're all they're scanned in here beautiful little pamphlets and um uh, and and they these are symptom cards and they had a media campaign and a website and all this additional information made available both to the public and to practitioners very important you guys are the most important in the in the chain here um, 
I just have to move my my bar, which is in the way. Here we go. So so together with with HeadSmart, together with the Brain Tumor Char Charity, you can see down the bottom here, they moved that diagnostic interval from 13 weeks down to six and a half weeks. They cut it by 50% serially over several iterations and a whole lot of academic literature, which I won't, I won't bore you with. Um, what's important here in one of the articles that I'll pick out, the greatest contribution for this delay is from the system interval, the time from the patient presenting to healthcare professionals to diagnosis. Parents bring their kids to clinics and hospitals. It's the systems that let them down. And, and not this is not throwing rocks. This is like, this is a collective heavy lifting we have to do. So what have we done, Snosa? Together with um, you know our local partners, we put together our own symptom card, but we put everything on one because we didn't want to overcomplicate things. And we put them not alphabetical, but by order of, commonality um, and that's available although we haven't printed funky versions of it um, so we talked in that meeting about what should we do and the big there are lots of things we can do and I've got a very enthusiastic young neurosurgeon who wants to work with me a little bit on this and there's an international consortium of us who are aligned with HeadSmart um, so lots of plans and thoughts one of the big difficulties is we're a little bit anxious about stepping out on our own because of course we don't want to we, we, we don't want to be seen to just be dealing with one tumor and, and we're having problems with all childhood cancer in South Africa. So part of it is also to lean back and do team sport with, with all of our, our partners. So we haven't quite decided what to do, but, but it certainly is very important. Um, uh, just keep an eye on the Q&A uh, for me, Audrey, and shout if there's anything right. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the tumors. I hope not to bore you too much. I, I'm really, again, going to pull out the highlights here rather than read slavishly through all the, the, the text. Um, medulloblastoma is common, and it's when properly treated, certainly standard risk medulloblastomas, you can get 70 to 80% five-year survival. That they, they can do well. And, and again, with proper multidisciplinarity and with a bit of good luck because it's tough rooting around in the brain, um, both from a surgical and a radi radiotherapeutic point of view, um, they can have pretty decent outcomes as well. Um, we, we, um, we see generally slightly more boys than girls. There's a group called the Wint Tumors. I'll make brief reference to that in a little while that do a little bit better and they tend to be mainly girls from a classic prognostic point of view there's different histologies and depending on what type of histology you have desmoplastic is very good generally anaplastic is bad generally um, stage wise so the more disseminated the tumor is the worse you'll do and then the the completeness of the surgery is, is quite crucial if you're left with a small residual you're fine if you're left with a big residual that's a problem Management, multidisciplinary, good surgery with CSF diversion being required. Um, I'm going to make reference a couple of times here today to a third ventriculostomy. So just as you guys, um, uh, non-oncology non guys, and even for the oncology guys whose cross-sectional anatomy is not as good as my rad onc brothers and sisters, remember if you sit in the middle of the third ventricle and look up, you will see the roof, and the roof is open to the... To the um, the, the basically the, the um, men, meningeal collecting system of the CSF. So if you make a hole in that roof, you can let the CSF that's damming up in the third ventricle because it's obstructed in, in, the, in the fourth ventricle, you can, you can release it. And that's a, much, that's a much more elegant way of dealing with pressure than putting in a VP shunt, which on the one hand, theoretically can spread cancer outside of the CNS. That's probably more theoretical although there are some documented cases but also um it it uh it's just an anidus for seizures and infection and drama so we like a, a, an etv radiotherapy classically 56 grade to the tumor and there's a whole lot of interesting recent literature on some nuances that are not pertinent to this meeting and then historically 36 gray which is a pretty big dose to the whole neuro axis to the brain and and um uh, and spine now unfortunately um uh you know 
the, the reducing that dose is, is be, be, be the focus of a lot of science in the last two decades. And I'll show you some heartening news and some disheartening news in a minute. But there are examples. There's one example in our system that Jeanette Parks refers to where a patient's the, the anterior part of the of the of the um, meningeal extent over the the, uh, the the forebrain wasn't completely covered. And the, I mean, a very small area. And that patient had a recurrence in the area that didn't have radiotherapy. So radiotherapy is super important, in, particularly in medulloblastoma, but in most brain tumors. So giving no radiotherapy unless the, the age is a problem is not an option. But we do try to reduce the dose. There's a variety of chemotherapies. That's not relevant for today. And there's all kinds of experimental strategies for the high-risk kids that don't do well. So here's a typical medulloblastoma. This is a group three because it's very brightly enhancing. Um, I'll show you that just now. It's kind of where molecular wizardry intersects with, with, uh, with radiology. So survival, as I said, for, for average risk kids is good. For the high risk kids, a bit more uh, um, uh, conservative, but many, many problems. Acutely, uh, cerebellar or brainstem fallout from the tumor or the surgery and mutism, which is a particularly weird phenomenon where the vermis of the cerebellum, particularly where the vermis has been operated because that's where the tumor happens to be. And these kids get very bizarre nystagmus. They can't, they, they're completely aphasic, although they, they, they make thoughts. They just, they, 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 um, the, the anatomy or the, the physiology of their speech because speech is terrible, it requires a lot of a lot of um, central planning in terms of all these little muscles working together. They just can't speak, and that can last variably after a surgery. And then a variety of long term problems, um, which I'll make mention of a bit later. So I won't talk about them now. So what have we done? We've reduced the extent of radiotherapy from the whole of the cerebellum to just the tumor. We did that safely. We've reduced the dose from 36 gray to 24 gray um, uh, without losing our sort of survival benefit um, and with some increase or, or decrease in the fallout. But unfortunately, and the guy, Jeff Mikulski, who ran the trial for 18 gray for standard risk kids, was he was quite gutted, the poor man, because he reported um, it was, oh, shucks, now thinking about it was, uh, six years ago now, but in, in Liverpool that that trial had failed. And in fact, there were excess relapses in the in the kids that got 18 gray. So we are trying to serially do less, but it's not always possible. What about the young kids? So that's very tricky because under three, focal radiation, as you'll see with a pendomoma, is doable, but craniospinal irradiation is an absolute no-no. The long-term out, outlook is devastating. Um, so variety of high dose chemotherapy regimens are tried, including in the high income countries uh, using stem cell rescue. And another option is to tide the kids over, especially if they're already in their third year of life until they're three and then, <clears throat> and then to, to give them radiotherapy. So that's all old hat. If you ask a modern neuro-oncologist in high income countries, he or she will tell you it's all about the molecular signature now. So now we know that these different groups, and I made reference to group three um, earlier, that tumor I showed you were, was almost certainly a group three, although we didn't have the molecular, we, do, we don't have routine access to the molecular um, diagnostics. We are trying to get that, and not just for Cape Town, but for the country. Um, but you can see that depending on what type of molecular makeup your tumor has you use maybe a you may be a different gender slightly older or slightly younger you may do very well and or you may do very badly and now this has been linked to a variety of other things so we know that based on how the tumors look so this is a, a sort of mock-up mris across the bottom um, with both the, the location and then the sort of the, the contrast enhancement gives you a pretty good idea of what sort of tumor you're dealing with so other embryonal tumors, there was a group called the supratentorial peanuts that looked like medulloblastomas, um, but actually there's a whole, from a molecular point of view, it's a whole soup. So that, that term is gone. Adieu, peanut, 
as my friend Francois Dos from France lectured a couple of years ago. And, and they, they look like a medulloblastoma, but, but they're quite variable. Pinealoblastomas, again, same type of histology, but these occur in the pineal region. And all of these need to be treated like high-risk medulloblastoma. So they need surgery as much as is feasible, chemo and radiation. And the results, in, it can be very good or very bad. I'd like to point out that this cartoon, I'm going to go back. This cartoon is now almost standard for any pediatric brain tumor. So the guys have, the guys in, in um, uh, DFKZ in, in Heidelberg, the guys in Toronto, the guys in St. Jude and Memphis have nailed down. In fact, they've now got 13 groups of medulloblastoma, which I think it's like stretching, stretching things beyond what, what is practically like practically will make a difference, but we can debate that. But this kind of cartoon is available for all of these things. So there are some supertentorial tumors that look like this, but do very, very well, like a, a, a cerebral neuroblastoma and others that do very poorly. And again, the pinealoblastoma, some have a very good outlook and some don't. And then lastly, the atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. This is a tumor with a similar small round blue cell signature, but they have these large rhabdoid shaped um, uh, cells and they, they uh, have a, a typical um, a, de a deletion or mutation of the INI1 gene, which you can do with immunohistochemistry. So if, guys, that's just a slide that's been stained with a particular um, tracer for one or other of these mutations. So you can pick it up. You don't need like a fancy Illumina machine or one of these next generation sequencing things. So they're pretty easy to diagnose and, and sadly often devastating because these kids do need, ideally they need a complete resection, chemo and radiation. And they're almost always under two, sometimes even younger, which makes that very, very difficult. Um, you can see this a kind of ugly looking fella here. And then they can occur in the kidneys also. Um, they, they, one of the strategies that we're looking at nowadays for them is to use focal radiotherapy rather than whole brain in the younger children. So gliomas, on the other hand, as I said earlier, you have a spectrum. This is a whole, forgive me, a jumble show of words, but no matter. Essentially from a grade one, very low grade tumor, like a polycytic astrocytoma, that just needs an operation and you sort it to a very high grade glioblastoma. This is the kind of thing, sadly, our grandparents tend to get rather than our kids. Uh, when, when children do get them and then they're very rare, then, then the outlook is usually pretty good. Um, uh, I've made reference to the high grade glioma. Um, and as I say, you need a surgery and then radiotherapy and then adjuvant temozolomide um, will, uh, uh, will 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 be of value. On the other hand, if you have a, a brainstem glioma now, um, um, who was it? Fiona made mention, I think, of DRPG. So that's an old term. And I mean, I'm not throwing rocks here. It's, it's, it, it's still used a lot and it's not wrong. It's just that they've been called now midline gliomas because it's a family of tumors. And they have, again, very different biological signatures. But sadly, in this case, you, the biopsy should be done because we're looking for targetable um, you know, mutations and changes. But most of us haven't yet got those instruments for treatment. So biopsy is a kind of a luxury. The only time we would really want a biopsy is if we had an older child and we thought it might be a low-grade tumor in the brainstem. So I'm talking about this. Whereas this looks like a typical midline glioma. And this is a currently a fatal diagnosis. Radiotherapy is a definitive treatment and the children will buy six to 18 months, uh, sometimes great quality before they progress again. Alan, there's a question from Christina in the chat. Uh, in the chat. What distinguishes a medulloblastoma from an astroblastoma? Does treatment differ? Yeah, Doug, yeah, very much so. Um, the astroblastoma has different histology, um, and uh, it's now the astroblastoma is actually part of this family that are called supertentor that used to be called supertentorial peanuts. So this is a, a tumor with an HGM1 mutation. That's how it's biologically described. 
and the treatment by and large is surgery and radiotherapy. Adjuvant chemotherapy for those kids, the best drug is probably temozolomide as opposed to medulloblastoma. So don't, don't be foxed by the blastoma part because there's a whole lot of blastomas and they're quite, they're quite distinct in that sense. And, and the nomenclature changes all the time as well. So, so I'm, yeah, I, I hope, I hope, Christina, that Christine, that's sufficient of an answer in the circumstances. I'm just cognizant of time. Um, so, so that was the high grade group, the, the super royal ones, difficult and very rare. And the, the midline gliomas are for us a tragedy because it starts with a conversation that, you know, that it's a fatal diagnosis. And I think that's the only, and I, I say that, but I, it's also important. You have to have that conversation. You have to put your cards on the table because you, you, you know, living in ignorance in that context doesn't help anybody. And it's amazing how young people and families can get quality out of their lives um, when they understand the processes. Um, and I want to advertise, there's a, there's a concept that's emerging in global oncology, which is called um uh that's the second time now if i do it th three times then i'll have to buy you a bottle of wine audrey um it's called time toxicity time toxicity is the time we take from kids and their families doing useless things that don't make them feel better and not changing the result that's what time toxicity is anyway um so low-grade glomas, on the other hand, they can be in all types of places. You can see them above the tentorium. The, the cerebellar JPA is the poster child for uh, the low-grade glioma. And we like that because Tony Fugazi will take that out and then we can pat the child gently on the head and they can go home. Um, or you can have a brainstem uh, tumor. Um, and a brainstem low-grade glioma is a very different prospect from a midline glioma. They're treatable with chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and they generally do reasonably well. So from a management point of view, if you can operate a low-grade glioma and it's out, then you, you're done. If you, have, um, an, if you have an irresectable tumor, particularly in an older child, and that when we say older now, we're talking in the, in the current sort of, the current thinking is at least eight. And in Europe and North America, they're now routinely giving chemotherapy to AYA patients. Uh, we can debate the wisdom of that. That's a long, complicated story. Um, certainly below eight, there's no question that you should give chemotherapy first and then see if you can resect the tumor, which usually you can't because it's in a place where it's not amenable to surgery and delay the radiotherapy for as long as possible. Um, I won't talk about NF1. So ependymomas, as I said, ependymal cells, which of course lie in your ventricles, are also part of the glial cells in the CNS, and they can occur anywhere. Obviously, the spine, the posterior fossa, even in the in the lateral ventricles up in the supratentorial space. So it's only about five or ten percent of brain tumors, um, and they do have a propensity for the posterior fossa for the third ventricle, and often present with hydrocephalus. Yes, yeah, surgery is crucial because the better your surgical resection, the better your outlook is. Within Within the limits of biology, again, biologically, there are uh, there's a whole subclassification. If you come to the brain tumor meeting, you can see about that, but we're not going to talk about it today. Um, and one of the things that we know is that radiotherapy is really important. And so in these kids, if there's no spread, you don't need to irradiate like you do with a medulloblastoma, the whole CNS axis. You just need focal radiotherapy. So that changes the game. Because focal radiotherapy you can give with less, not zero, but less neurocognitive and neurological fallout. And so the, the age cutoff here has gone much lower. But you'll appreciate that focal radiotherapy is also used for low-grade gliomas. And we wait until they're eight. The, the difference is that ependymomas, once they recur, tend to be fatal. You can treat them again. And repeating even the focal radiotherapy has been done with some success. But usually it's just temporizing. Chemotherapy hasn't, hasn't attracted a huge following. There's, I mean, most of us have had not great experience using chemotherapy in small children with irresectable ependymomas. And um, there's a question mark. There was a big PSYOP European-based trial where they randomized the kids to 
everyone got surgery then everyone got radiotherapy and you were allowed to go get proton therapy which is sexy and decreases your 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 fallout in the united states if you're on the trial and then they randomize them to randomize the kids to getting chemo or no chemo after the radiation to see if it would help that's a, there's an open trial still in the u.s on the same basis so of course what happened because the the parents are, are astute and they read. And so they got on the trial, they had the surgery, they went to the US, got their protons, came home and said, actually, we've changed our minds. We don't feel like having the chemo. So, so they voted on their feet. But anyway, it may still, the data I'm told through back channels doesn't look too bad. So it may be that chemotherapy becomes a standard of care in, in, in ependymomas as well. Craniopharyngiomas are a bugger. These kids, because this thing is right in the middle, it's Rathke's cyst, that's a little blue dot up there on the right. And because this is right in the center of the universe from a neuroendocrine and, and neurophysiological perspective, the kids get pan and they get visual difficulties and growth failure and all the, and often at diagnosis. So unlike other brain tumors where the guys pick up these things through the course of their treatment and their follow-up, yeah, you've got kids who are already damaged when they present. And the difficulty is trying to keep them from getting more damaged. So the careful calibration of who gets an operation, again, in an area like this, who gets uh, radiotherapy, who gets uh, um, local um, uh, interferon installation into their tumor cyst is very difficult and not the stuff of today's lecture. Germ cell tumors are more of an AYA issue. So this is the 10 to 20 year age group, age group. So our community, because of our kind of, you know, our, our age metrics in South Africa and the, certainly in the public service tend to see less of them. Whereas our radon colleagues tend to pick them up in their late teens. Um, and the, 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 the outlook is variable. Germanomas are very treatable. Um, and they generally, they don't elaborate alpha fetoprotein or beta HCG. Germ cell tumors do, obviously by their name, um, make uh, generally AFP, sometimes beta HCG, if there's a choriocarcinoma element, um, but they may also make nothing. So that would be the, the group that get a, generally get a biopsy if you don't have a marker. If you have a marker, you have a diagnosis. Um, there are there's certainly... I will say, having said that, there's space to, to if on an emergent basis, if you get a child with a germinoma who's comatose from, from their tumor, um, you may on some occasions start radiotherapy because they're very radiotherapy sensitive. So the germinomas could, could be treated with a whole ventricle um, uh, only. There are some studies now using neoadjuvant chemo. So give chemo first, and if they have a great response, then you can give some there's some discussion about whether focal is safe or whether you give reduced dose whole ventricle, but they're complicated algorithms and still a lot of discussion. Whereas the mixed germ cell tumors, the ones that make markers or the ones that don't make markers, those guys need intensive um, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Okay, so so that's a, a walk through the woods from a from a tumor point of view. And I see I've still got some time, Audrey, which I'm very pleased about. I wasn't sure how long I would go, but it gives us a good 10 minutes to chat. Before I stop though, in the in the moment, so now if you are, um, I'm, 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 I'm putting you as a pediatrician or a GP who's either referred a very dear patient of yours who you looked after for some time with a newly diagnosed brain tumor to ask to one of our referral centers for further management, um, or if, in fact, um, the patient's been diagnosed and you're doing shared care with those guys. So, you know, helping well, those, us helping us look after the patient, then remember that we, we try to avoid VP shunts, um, but where the patients do have VP shunts, please keep in mind they can get blocked, they can get infected. And so when a patient's suddenly off their game, that may be the explanation. And a quick non-contrasted scan which we will do. I'm not suggesting you should necessarily do it, but you, you can um, if, you, if, if, if that's available in your setting, we'll sort that out. Um, steroids are very important. Um, you really, if it's a brain tumor, you, you can't do harm. Um, I will say that um, if we 
have children on chemotherapy for reasons to do with drug access through the blood-brain barrier, we try not to use dexamethasone as an antiemetic in that specific setting. But anyone with a neuro neurosurgical, neuro-oncological emergency, um, you know, one should give consideration to dexamethasone unless there are any other contraindications. Um, and it's very important if a patient's on dexamethasone, if you're doing shared care, that you just do a check-in about what meds they're on. Because if you have one of those craniopharyngioma patients I was referring to, they may be on little, they may be, you know, carrying a little wheelbarrow behind them with all their meds in it. Bulbar palsy sometimes need nasogastric tube feeding. So particularly if that's evolving and you, the child's having trouble swallowing, um, you may need to, to be careful that you don't land up with an aspiration. A, a tube will help you in the short term, but sometimes um, the guys... Um, if, if the sense is that then it's not likely to improve in the short term, they need a peg. And then involving physio, OT, and neurodevelopmental rehab is critical. Um, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute, and there's a person missing there, um, uh, which is the, the educational psychologist, who, who is absolutely key to trying to maximize the survivorship of these kids. Analgesia-wise, just be cautious about one thing. Many opiates cause vasodilation. Morphine is the worst of them. So morphine is absolutely a, not a cool drug. I mean, it is absolutely a cool drug, but in this setting, when a child has a horrible headache, by and large, it's not a good idea. If you're in a hospital setting, fentanyl, um, IV is usually much better. I know it's an opiate. It just doesn't have the same degree of vasodilation. Um, in, intravenous perfalgan, uh, non-steroidals and other agents and all the adjuvants like clonidine and uh, the, 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 the gabapentinoids like Lyrica, that's pregabalin or, or gabapentin can help. And then lastly, I made reference earlier to all those late effects. That was quite a shopping list. I'm trying to make a more high level summary because I've seen all of these. And recently, number one, two, three, seven, a kid of mine who gosh, got a ton of, 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 of side effects and late effects and has awful teeth. So when I say dental issues, I mean, it really can be a massive problem. But of all the things here, the neurocognitive things stand out. Kids struggle through education. They struggle as AYAs and adults to get gainful, meaningful employment. Their behavioral issues, relationships are affected, both the ones that pre-exist and, of course, the ability to form new relationships and quality of life. So it's really... It's a difficult paradigm. And you know, the thing is, again, it's the same old story. The earlier they're diagnosed, the less they're damaged and the less that this stuff. Generally, it's not, you want to be careful. Sometimes the biology of the tumor will get you no matter what you do. So it's not always the fault of the system, but we can do the best we can do. Uh, I think, yeah, that's me. So like I say, you've got all kinds of people that are not labeled here. And I'm going to ask a question. What famous literary figure is in this picture? And I'll tell you a funny story if you have time. But who's not here is Amy Dolman, who's our educational psychologist, and she should be. I just ran out of time. So I hope you're not on the call, Amy, but I'm apologizing anyway, publicly. So now here's my question. Come on. What famous literary figure is in this picture? I'm going to look in the chat or the Q&A. I'm going to leave that open. I'll call it like the wonder years. So, okay, that was a lot of talking. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'll I'll keep my I'll, I'll keep my fun story till the end. Alan, um, yes, um, I think that that the, the the cancer that are most stigmatized is uh, could that be the, the brain tumors? Oh, you know, it's it's difficult to say. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I think I think it's cancer in general, Audrey. I think mm -hmm. that and and also I think that's changing quite a lot. I must say that's it's one of the things that I've been more heartened about 
than you know than I, I, in in recent years. I think the community, yes, Ali Matu has answered the question correctly. It's Wally Sienka, and I'll tell you the story just now. So thanks for that. Um, uh, so the, the reason I'm just my sense is that people deal with with a diagnosis a little bit differently than than they used to. I think communities are more open than they were. Um, you know, I've had very heartening interactions and experiences with people's communities, with employers who've come. Uh, uh, it was in fact a brain tumors. Uh, brain tumor's mother brought a friend with her so I said well you know she wanted to, can my friend come in I said of course not but who is your friend like who are you turns out she's not a friend well she she was but she was actually from the the employer she'd come to see what they could do to help so I mean I think there's a there's a, a gradually improving chaos about that you know I think we also have to accept that the, the difficulties that we we're looking after a particular group of patients that are very precious to us inside a system which has many, many mouths to feed, whatever those are, you know. Um, and so, I mean, there's a big question. It's a philosophical question, nothing to do with my topic today, which is what's the best way forward? Should we be working more with our partners? That would be, for example, in pediatrics, so locally SARPA, internationally the international pediatric association and i think you're aware audrey that siop has partnered with ipa for the cedar series so we're doing this kind of thing internationally because ipa gets like 800 people to a seminar and we're doing awareness of childhood cancer in those series and also do we partner more with adult oncology i mean locally we work with radiation oncologists all the time they're absolutely crucial to to, to what we do but should we be looking for synergies? It's difficult. On the other hand, we have to look after our own constituency also. So I think it's a it's a balancing act of involving all of those different uh, um, different uh, sectors. Huh, okay. Oh gosh, Amy is on the on the call. So like, I'll definitely add it next time, Amy. I'm so sorry. Shucks. Anyway, so. Audrey, I'm going to just entertain the, the house because I think I've done enough talking about very serious matters. And just to say, guys, going back to my original point, if if as a, a community, and I hope there are some pediatricians and GPs, if you take that central message out, just that um, brain tumors amongst childhood cancer, they're not that rare. Um, so, so according to my metric, if you're a pediatrician, every fifth year, you should see a brain tumor and you can make a big difference in terms of time yes referral and so on. And sometimes it's also about the call from the GP because you may not see the patient, you may just get a call asking for some advice. Um, and, that, and, and I think secondly to say that the one thing that is definitely a characteristic of my community is that we always open to a, a phone call or an email to like say, look, what should I do with this patient? Um, Preferably not sending me scans on the WhatsApp. People are sending me smaller and smaller things. I get older, my vision gets worse, and then they send me tiny, tiny things in the WhatsApp, which I struggle with. So please just use the email. Now let me tell you my Wally Sienka story because Ali Marty will enjoy this. Turan, Naika, and I were going to the first NOSA meeting in Nigeria, and we were at OR Tambo, and there I spot Wally in the lounge. So I'm much too embarrassed to go up. I mean, like a fan person i don't want to be politically incorrect and like ask for a selfie but i said it to Rand, stand there just stand exa exactly where you know i can get a picture so because i got there i got him by stealth you know so it's proof so she's like don't be silly man and i'm like no thanks i've got my picture i'm happy so we go down to the airplane to board and of course guess where wally sienka is going he's going obviously to, to lagos because he's nigerian so as he's standing there at the gate, somebody comes up and says, can I take a selfie? And you know what he says? He says, no pictures. No, thank you very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got my picture. So I've got it. Besides ap apologizing to Amy Dolman, I have to apologize to a Nobel Literature Prize winner as well. But I'm sure he doesn't mind. So he's quietly famous in pediatric oncology. 
Okay. All right. And that's the hour. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks, um, Alan. That was absolutely amazing. And I think um, this the, the doctors have a lot to, to take away. Um, we all have a lot to take away um, with us um, after this talk. We really appreciate uh, the time that you've given to us and um, on this, this last webinar of the year. <laughs> Can't believe we, we are tomorrow's December already and uh, Christmas is around the corner. But thank you so much. We really, really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank the Chuck team and, and Wayne from Brand Race for, for his assistance. I want to thank everybody who attended today. Um, if you have any questions uh, or need to refer a child, um, the doctors, the pediatric oncologists always say uh, you can contact them directly, but you're also welcome to, to go on uh, the CHOC website. There's a, um, a refer a child button and we will assist as far as possible. There's also a, a helpline, a toll-free helpline, um, 0800 555 we can call if you want to speak to, to a, um, a pediatric oncologist. So, um, yes, and if I don't talk again, I want to wish you everything of the best for the festive season. Um, and, yeah, go out there and make a difference in the lives of childhood cancer. And let's all work together to ensure that no child is left behind, um, but that um, we save our children and to give them the best that we can. Um, the doctors from the medical point of view and us as the NGO from a comprehensive care um, this, um, point of view. So again, thank you very much for everybody. I don't see any more questions in the chat. And um, thanks, Alan. Thanks, everybody. A pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day and uh, go well. God bless.